the sky. I think about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly away. I believe I can soar. I see me running through that open door. I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. is coming in your life let's close our eyes for prayer father in the name of jesus we thank you for the privilege of being here together with your people lord we pray tonight you'll bless everyone every confusion you'll take away trouble trauma you'll take away any commotion in any heart any family you'll take away let there be peace in everyone tonight in jesus name Amen. bless us and bless everyone hearing tonight in jesus mighty name we pray Amen. god has blessed you you can sit down we're coming to john chapter 14. in john chapter 14 i'm reading from verse 27. john chapter 14 verse 27 peace i live with you my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Brother, sister there, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. As we come to the passage tonight, I want to remind you, it was a special moment, a special period in the life of Jesus Christ and with the disciples of Jesus Christ, actually, Christ was going near and getting near the time of betrayal and the time of the crucifixion. Judas was not in this meeting. Judas had gone out. The Pharisees were not in this meeting. All those Sadducees were not here. Here we have a closed door meeting, an inner circle meeting. A meeting of the Lord Jesus Christ with his own disciples, sinners outside, backsliders outside, the apostates outside, everyone acting contrary to the will of the Father and the will of Jesus, all of them are outside. And Jesus now had a heart to heart talk with his own disciples. Why were they outside? Those people 
Sadducees, Pharisees, Judas Iscariot, sinners, backsliders. Look at Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 37. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as the hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? And tell me, he would not. He wanted to bless them, he wanted to save them, he wanted to heal them. He wanted to deliver them. He wanted to write their names in the book of life in heaven. He wanted to give them a heavenly blessing. But it says, ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. That's the reason why he forsook them. He left them. He left them outside the kingdom. And now he came into his disciples and was sharing something deep, something high, something great and broad. With his own disciples, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 41. It was a sorrowful scene for the Lord Jesus Christ that these people who should have received the blessings of God, they rejected the blessing. And now he had to go away from them. Look at Luke chapter 19, verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou art known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. He was the prince of peace, and he's still the prince of peace. He brought his peace to them. He brought tranquility to them. He brought total rest. He brought ultimate rest. He brought complete rest for them. But they would not. And he said, if you had only known what I brought to you, if you had only known what's available for you, but because you didn't know and you have not accepted, he said, he led their house to them as desolate. Look at verse 43. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even on the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave thee in thee one stone upon another because, because, you know, he wanted to save them but they were not saved because he wanted to heal them. They were not healed because he wanted to bless them with heavenly blessing, but they were not blessed because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. I pray you'll know the time of your visitation. And so that's the reason why Jesus now went into this closed door meeting with his own disciples. And has been revealing to them great and mighty things. And in what we're looking at today, we're looking at perfect peace for true and transformed disciples. Perfect peace for true and transformed disciples. We are coming back now to John chapter 14. And I'm reading from verse 27. John chapter 14, verse 27. You understand? The people who are listening to him now, who are the people that believed on him. Who are the people that trusted him. Who are the people that loved him. These were disciples, true disciples. These were disciples, transformed disciples. And was going to now bring his peace unto them. The world had rejected that peace. So he brought the peace to the people that believed. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Jews who had turned away from him, they rejected the peace. They didn't know the time of their visitation. And now Christ came to them and said in verse 27, Peace I live with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Every trouble he'll take away. All the problems, the pressures, he'll take away. Everything that contradicts your progress, he'll wipe off even tonight in Jesus' name. 
neither let it be afraid. Hear, heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye love me, ye would rejoice because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. I know you believe. I believe. I said I believe. And the blessings of faith will come upon your life. Look at verse 30. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you. The prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. That's the passage we're looking at tonight. Three points we're looking at. Number one, the partakers of his peace through his word. The partakers of his peace through his word. Point number two, the people without his peace or worthiness. They made themselves unworthy and they lack his peace. The people without his peace or worthiness. Number three, his power over the prince of this world. He has power, all power, complete power. And nothing of the prince of this world will overcome him overcome you as you believe on the Lord in Jesus' name. It's power over the prince of this world. Point number one. Tell me there. Point number one. The partakers of his peace through his word. I'm coming to uh, chapter 14, verse 27. It says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. He says, I'm giving you peace. And then he says, if you look at the middle of that verse, he says in that verse, let not your heart be troubled. He says, I'm giving you peace. And it says, neither let each be afraid. As we look at what Jesus Christ has said, and he's saying he's giving peace, and you look at the New Testament and also the Old Testament, and see the kind of peace that comes from the Lord. There are three aspects of the peace. Number one, peace with God. Peace with God. Number two, there is the peace of God. The peace of God. Number three, there is the God of peace. The God of peace. Let's look at that. Number one, it says, peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. How does that peace come to you? How does that peace come to people today? We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, you'll find that Jesus Christ is the author of peace. Jesus Christ is the giver of peace. Jesus Christ is the fountain of peace. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 12, that at that time, he were without Christ, talking about when or was still in the world in sin. It says, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was in the past, but now, somebody help me say, but now. Things are different now. As we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we turn away from our sins, he said, in the past, we, are not, we didn't have God, we didn't have peace, we didn't have joy, we didn't have the blessing of God. But he says, but now, in Christ Jesus, he who was sometimes afar off, are made nice by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. He is our peace. At salvation, that peace comes. When you repent of your sin, all the enmity between you and the Almighty God, all that is consumed. And all the commotion, all the strife, everything is taken away. And now you are reconciled unto the Lord. And he says, for he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of 
when one new man so making tell me peace he makes peace between us and the almighty god and let's come to romans chapter 5 romans chapter 5 we're reading from verse 1 the peace we have with god it says in romans chapter 5 verse 1 therefore being justified by faith we have peace with god no more fear peace with god no enmity fear with god I fear peace with god and there's no one of demarcation or division or separation from god there is peace with god because we are justified because through the blood of jesus christ our sins are forgiven and he gives us peace in our heart and then he says it's through our lord jesus christ Look at verse 5, and hope maketh not ashamed. You will not be ashamed. Because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. That's the reconciliation that brought the peace. And if you have not been reconciled with God, if you don't know what this peace is, come to Christ today, and this peace will be given to you in Jesus' name. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And all things of God, who has reconciled us to himself. He has reconciled us to himself. We're no more far away from God. We're no more enemies of God. And we're no more carrying weapons against the Almighty God. We're reconciled. It's now our Heavenly Father. All things of God, who has reconciled us to himself. By Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation to which that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation as we have come into the kingdom and we are reconciled with God and our sins are forgiven and we have the peace of God in our hearts we go to tell our neighbors and we tell them that the word of reconciliation is coming to them. They too can be reconciled with God. Now then, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Everybody tell me, be ye reconciled to God. Reconciliation has now come. You see, when we have that peace, number one, with God, we also have the peace of God. The peace of God. That is the peace that the world cannot take away. The peace that the world cannot disturb. The peace that is flowing like a river. Because we are now children of God and we belong to the Lord, so that peace keeps on flowing. Let's look at Psalm 85. Psalm 85, I'm reading from verse 8. Psalm 85, reading from verse 8. See the peace he gives us. In Psalm 85, verse 8, it says, I will hear what God, what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people. He's speaking peace to your heart, peace in your family, and peace all around you in Jesus' name. He says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But, but let them not turn again to folly. He says, because we have repented, that's where the peace has come. Because we take Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that's how the peace has come. Because we forsook our sin, we forsook our foolishness, and we forsook our past life, and we say, now I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and his grace has come into your life, and has forgiven you, and has taken the body and the load of sin away. He says that peace will continue on one condition. We must not return back to foolishness. You will not go back. Isaiah chapter 26 the peace of God. Isaiah chapter 26, and I'm reading here from verse 2. Isaiah 26, verse 2. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation, may, uh, which keepeth the truth, may enter in. You see that? 
as we come to the Lord, he makes us righteous. And now we can come through the gate into the kingdom. And the kingdom of Christ is the kingdom of peace. And he says, is the righteous nation. Look at verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind is staged on thee. Because he trusteth in thee. Because you trust him. And because you rely on him. Because you're not shaking. You're not saying, okay, if this is not working, I'll go to the abalis. If this one is not working, I'll go to that. I'll go to that. No, your mind is stayed on Christ. And because your mind is stayed on Christ, he'll give you what kind of peace there? Perfect peace. Look at verse 4. Trust ye in the Lord. How long? Trust in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. In the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And when you trust him, what will he continue to do? Look at verse 12. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us. All the fear in your heart, gone. Trouble in your heart, gone. And the kind of anxiety in the place of work, I don't know what will happen. I don't know what they will do. All that gone in Jesus' name. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou hast also wrought all our works in us. Then in verse 13, O Lord our God, all the lords beside thee have had dominion over us. Forged by thee, by thee only, we will make mention of thy name. You see that you come to the kingdom of God, and as you come to the kingdom of God, this peace perfect peace comes to your heart, comes to your life, and as you keep on trusting in the Lord, any problem that wants to disturb that peace, wants to take away that peace, the Lord will take that problem away. You'll be free. Say, I am free already. And the peace of God will reign in your heart and your life in Jesus' name. We're coming to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Romans chapter 14, verse 17, it says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You see that there is righteousness in the kingdom. And as you continue in the righteousness of the Lord, then the peace of God will continue to reign in your life in Jesus' name. I thought I'll hear some amen there. In Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 15. Colossians chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 15. It says, and let the peace of God rule in your heart. Sometimes something will happen, maybe in the family. I have to try to disturb your serenity of mind, your tranquility, and your rest. And it says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Sometimes it's in the community. Sometimes it's in the place of work. Sometimes it's the news you are hearing from the village. And they say this is happening and that is happening. And then that will try to bring turmoil and confusion in your heart. But you remember you are at peace with God. And because you are at peace with God, that peace will continue to rule and reign in your life in Jesus' name. Verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful. Look at verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you scantily. Let the word of Christ dwell in you superficially. Let the word of God and let the word of Christ dwell in you tell me richly, abundantly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do, this is how the, how the peace will continue. Your peace will continue. Peace in your heart. Peace in your mind. Peace in your family. Peace all around you. Peace in our local churches. It says, whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. That's how the peace of God will continue. Now, there is also the peace of God. The peace of God. 
sorry, the God of peace. You see what we are talking about? There is the peace of God. It's coming from God. And it will fill your heart. It will fill your soul. And it will keep you at peace every time. But then there's something still higher. There's something still greater. There's something still deeper, which is the God of peace himself. We're looking at, uh, at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and I'm going to read to you verse 7, and then I will read verse 9. And you see the reason why I'm doing that. We're looking at uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse, tell me there, verse 7, verse 7, are you there? It says, and the peace of God, you see that, and the peace of God, but then as you come to verse 9, verse 9, the last line of verse 9, and the God of peace shall be with you. You see, it's coming from the peace of God. You see, when you, when you become saved, you have peace with God. And then as you are living your life in submission to the Lord, in surrender to the Lord, you have the peace of God. And then you go deeper, you go higher, you go further, and there is the God of peace, and this brings sanctification. Three things. Number one, there is salvation. Number two, there is submission. Number three, there is sanctification. Number one, in relation to the peace that God gives us, number one, salvation through Christ grants us peace with God. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We are justified, we are forgiven, our sins are erased, our sins are taken away, and we have Salvation. You remember that uh, for us, peace, purity, power, mine, mine in the Lord, mine in the Lord. Peace, that's the beginning. Peace with God. And peace that we have that comes through salvation. Number two, there is submission to Christ resulting in the peace of God. In the peace of God. That was Father. Because now we go from salvation, and now that I'm saved, now that I'm born again, there is submission to Christ, and that gives me the peace of God. And then I say there's still more, there's still more. After salvation, after submission to Christ, there is sanctification by Christ, and that leads us to the peace of God. Let's come now to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 6. Be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Be worried about nothing because all will be well. I said all will be well. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Verse 7, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding. The peace of God which passes all understanding. What does that mean? You have the peace of God. And then some people like your neighbors, they see some things that are happening. And then you're still having peace. They're surprised. Because this peace of God passes all understanding. Your classmates, they're worried. And uh, your neighbors, they're worried. And your co-workers, they're worried. And maybe there is a kind of problem at home. Uh, and the people that know about that problem, they're worried about this. They're even anxious for you. But you are calm. I said you are calm. You're cool. I said you are cool. Because you know God is on the throne. You say, I feel him inside me. The peace he gives me. And I know all will be well. And as I look at you tonight, whatever you left at home, whatever you are thinking about, all will be well. Yeah. And because of that conviction inside your heart, that's why it says, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, you see, that's what keeps us in that peace of God. We don't think about things that are not true. Whatever Satan says, that's not true. Whatever those sinners say, that's not true. Whatever those some believers say, that's not true. All the people who are anxious and worried, whatever they say, that's not true. And we're not going to think about that. 
If you're going to keep your peace of mind, if you're going to keep the peace of God, you're going to think about only the things that are true. Look at this. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, he's saying things that are dishonest, uh-uh, you're not thinking about that. Dishonest gain, dishonest business, you'll not think about that. And whatsoever things are just, that's what you think about. Injustice, no, that's not part of your thinking. Whatsoever things are pure, anything impure, anything immoral, you're not thinking about that. And whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Your thoughts affect your state of mind. What you're thinking about, if you're thinking about the promises of Christ, those things are true. The power of Christ, those things are true. And the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, those things are true. All the provisions of the Lord, all those things are true. If you are thinking about those things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and good of good report, you'll have peace of mind. I said you'll have the peace of God. And look at verse 9. And those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. And the God of peace shall be with you. Looks like your days are going to be different from now. Your nights are going to be different from now. And your state of mind, your state of mind, everything is going to be different from now in Jesus' name. Hey, look at you, look at what the prince, what the uh, God of peace, what he does. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You see the people who cherish the God of peace and the peace of God, they're not uh, putting their hands and their mouths and their lives and their involvement into things that appear to be evil. It says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Look at this, look at this. And the very, tell me, God of peace, the very God of peace. Remember, number one, there is peace with God. Remember, number two, there is peace of God. Now, number three is the God of peace. And remember, number one, the peace we have with God, the salvation. Remember, number two, the peace of God, that's our submission in Christ. And then, number three now, the God of peace. This relates to sanctification. Look at verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. How will he sanctify you? Partially. In a little way. He says, it will sanctify you how? Holy. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved, blameless, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you be sanctified? And God do it where you are living and you know people are troublesome and they bring temptation, they bring trial and they try to annoy somebody, they try to you know push you here and push you there, taking the bus and going in a taxi and splashing something on you. Can you be sanctified? You know, we say, why? Maybe your wife is not a believer. Maybe some of the children are having difficulties and, you know, kind of, uh, they are rebellious and they are disobedient. And they, they will make somebody, you know, somebody that has children like this, somebody cannot be sanctified. Can you be sanctified? Of course, yes. Look at this. It says in verse 24, faithfully see that call it you. Tell me who also will do it. He will do it for you. I said he will do it for you. Sanctification by the God of peace. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 20. Remember now the God of peace. The God of peace. Um, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant verse 21 make you make me make me 
is a God of peace that will do it. Number one, the peace with God. Number two, the peace of God. Number three, the God of peace. The God of peace make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and ever. Amen. He'll accomplish it in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. The people without his peace or worthiness. We're coming to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And we're reading here from verse 27. In verse 27, it says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Now that's talking to the disciples. Those who trust him. Those who love him. Those who rely on him, those who believe him, and those who are following him intimately. And they're not going to allow anything to separate between Christ and them. But now he says, not as the world giveth. Not as the world giveth. We're talking about the people now outside the kingdom, the world. We're talking about the people that have rejected Jesus. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And he says, but to them who received him, and to them who believe, he gave them to become the sons of God. He said, the world was made by him, and the world will not receive him. And he's talking about that world now. That world, it says that those people, they do not have his peace. Those people, they do not have his worthiness. They are not worthy of the peace of God because they rejected three things we're looking at about these people. Number one, no peace for the wicked. No peace for the wicked. The people who will not drop their wickedness and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no peace for them. Number two, no peace for the worldly wise. The worldly wise, that is, they think they are wise, they are wiser than the salvation the Lord is providing. They are wiser than the words the Lord was speaking. And he counted the words of Christ, the word of salvation, and the word of life eternal. He counted that as foolishness. There is no peace for the worldly wise. Number three, there is no peace for wanting worshippers. The people that worship, but they are found wanting. They are weighed and found wanting. There is no peace for them. Let's look at it one by one. Number one here, no peace, tell me, for the wicked. We're looking at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 3, we're looking at verse 17. It says, the way of peace they have not known. The way of peace they have not known. Who are these people that the way of peace they have not known? Let's look at it from verse 10. It says, that is, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. The people who have not come to Jesus Christ so that their righteousness can be taken away. Their sin can be taken away. Their wickedness can be taken away. It says, there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. The way of salvation, they have gone out of the way. The way of righteousness, they have gone out of the way. The highway of holiness, they have gone out of the way. It says they are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. It says they are through. Look at this. The people who do not know the way of peace, who do not have the peace of God, even though they might say, I go to church, I read the Bible, I pray, I do this and that. But you know, if, the, if their throat is an open sepulcher, with their tongues they have used the seed, the poison of arms of serpents is under their leaves, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Tell me, verse 17, 1, 2, 3, go. And the way of peace they have not known. Those people do not have the peace of God because they have not surrendered their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. You find them sometimes on the side of the road, they are fighting. 
You find them sometimes in the neighborhood. You're hearing the noise of the husband and the wife. He's breaking my head. He's breaking my head. And then the man is saying, he's taking a knife. He's taking a knife. They do not have peace. They do not know peace because they do not have the prince of peace abiding in them. Even without any provocation, they will fight. Even without anybody touching them or anybody harassing them, if they don't see a fight, they will make a fight because they are not saved, they are not born again. They do not have the prince of peace in them. But when you have the prince of peace in you, things will be totally different. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah chapter 48, and I'm reading from verse 20. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 20. It says, Go, for, go ye forth out of Babylon. Flee ye from the Chaldeans. With the voice of singing, declare ye. Tell this, utter it even to the end of the earth. Say ye, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. And it says, Is that state not? which when he led them through the desert, he caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He claimed the rock also, and the waters gushed out. Verse 22, everybody, one, two, three, go. There's no peace, says the Lord, unto the wicked, while he's blessing his people. While he's saving those who are repenting, while he's uh, turning their lives around, and he's giving them the willingness to submit to the Lord and to make right their ways, and if they have any restitution, to make those restitution, and they are happy and joyful because things are different now with them. For the people who are wicked, they're looking at that believer, they're saying, What's happening to him? Why is he making right his life? Why is he doing restitution? Why is he correcting the things that were wrong before? Because they don't understand the peace of God has come. And because the peace of God has come, they want to submit to the God of peace. And the peace of God will rule in their hearts. And it says, there is no peace, says the Lord, unto the wicked. You will not remain wicked. I said you will not remain wicked. Because there's no peace on earth. There's no peace in eternity for the wicked. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57. I'm reading from verse 20. Isaiah chapter 57. Verse 20. But the wicked are like the troubled sea. The wicked, the sinner, the unbeliever, the one fighting, the violent man, the adulterous man, and the fornicating woman. Anyone that has not known the Lord Jesus, it says the wicked are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Verse 21, everybody want to three go. There's no peace, says God, my God, to the wicked. There's no peace for them on earth. There's no peace for them on the other side of this world. Revelation chapter 6. In Revelation chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 4. It says in Revelation chapter 6 verse 4, are you opening your Bible? You're so quiet. I said, are you opening your Bible? Okay, Revelation chapter 6 verse 4. It says, and there went out another horse that was rich. And power was given to him that search thereon to take peace from the earth. That's the time of the great tribulation. And because the rapture will take place any time from now. And when the saints go marching in, thank God I will be there. I said I will be there. After the rapture, there will be the great tribulation. And that time of the great tribulation will be a time when the Antichrist will rule. A time when there will be no peace on earth. That's why it says over here, that time of the tribulation, that this uh, power and this personality will take peace from the earth. That they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. What will happen to the rich? What will happen to, you know, the highly placed people, those who, who did not go in the rapture? Look at verse 15. Verse 15, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, 
and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And he said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne and from the rocks of the Lamb. That time of the great tribulation will be a time of wrath. There will be no peace at that time, for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall abide, who shall be able to stand? Nobody at that time will be able to stand. But well, thank God if you're a believer, and you have peace with God, and you maintain that peace with God, you'll not be here at the time of the great tribulation in Jesus' name. Number one, no peace for the wicked. Number two, no peace for the worldly wise. The worldly wise. You see, there are people, they think uh, they have wisdom. They're not saved. They think they have wisdom. They're not born again. They think they have wisdom. If you open the Bible, and you open a part of the Bible, they come with worldly wisdom. And they say, well, about that, you know, God knows who I am. And he knows uh, how great I am. And he, uh, think about it. A person of my position, I control this, I control that. Do you think that anybody, look at the kingdoms of this world, the government of this world. If I go to America, they recognize me. If I go to Europe, they recognize me. And nobody can just, you know, lay hands on me and say, because I didn't believe in somebody who died on the cross of Calvary, then they will take me and put me somewhere don't believe that. I don't believe that they are worldly wise. They'll be surprised on the final day. I pray that you will not be like them in Jesus' name. Uh, look at James chapter 3. James chapter 3. They think they are wise, the worldly wise. I'm reading from James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his words with meekness of wisdom. Look at this, verse 14. But if you have bitter envy and strive in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth. If you say, well, I go to church, but you have bitterness. If you say, I, I worship the Lord, but you are lying. And if you say you are worshiping the Lord, but you have strive, it says this wisdom. This wisdom, worldly, worldly wisdom, it says this wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, is sensual, and is devilish. Where, for where envy and strife is, there's confusion and every good work. You see, there's no peace there. You so say they have their wisdom, and it is worldly wisdom. Look at verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. You see anybody that says, I have wisdom, but it's hypocritical. It's a respecter of people. It's, he has double standard. It's like this over here. It's like that over there. And he's trying to use uh, political wisdom, worldly wisdom, human wisdom, devilish wisdom. And the sensual wisdom. So he says, I know how to get my way through. To those people who are difficult, I know how to get my way through. And to those who are simple, I know how to get my way through. And if I'm in Rome, I know how to get my way through. I'm in Rome, I do like the Romans. And when I come to Jerusalem, I do like the Israelites do. When I'm in Egypt, I do like the Egyptians do. I'm able to just wank on my way through because I have wisdom. It is worldly wisdom, and such people, they'll not have the peace of God. I pray you'll not be like that. Look at James chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. It says, from whence come wars and fightings among you, come did not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members, ye lost, and have not, ye kill, and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because he has not. Ye ask and receive not, because he ask amiss, that she may consume it upon your laws. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, tell me, is the enemy of God. They know the ways of the world so much. 
And before you, there are some people, they specialize in the Proverbs of the world. They don't know Bible. They don't know the verses of the Bible. Anything that happens like this, as you are discussing, they want to buttress their point. They cannot buttress their point. They cannot support their, their point with the scripture, with the word of God. There will be a proverb they will bring out. And it is a you know, proverb that is uh, talking about something in the world that if a hen uh, you know, um, kind of uh, puts over your liquid or what concoction, then you will do something to that one. That, that's the principle they have. They know the proverbs of the world. They do not know the commandments of God. But the Lord is telling us all those people who are worldly wise. And then, you know, they say, you know, I'm a trained person. What do you mean by that? They train me in psychology. They train me in philosophy. They train me in this and they train me in that. And all the training they've got in the world, they bring into the church. And when they are relating with us pastors, they are relating with, you know, us members of the church. It is the wisdom of the world they are using. And those uh, people, you will not have the peace of God. You will not have the peace of God here on earth. Neither will you have the peace of God in eternity. But when you come to Christ, you abandon worldly wisdom. Give me a good amen. amen. And then when you have the wisdom of God, your life will be straightened out. There will be peace in your heart. There will be peace in your life. There will be peace in your family. Look up at me here. There are some people, they come to church, even in their families, husband and wife, their husband he has worldly wisdom. Worldly it says, you know, if you are not wise, you know, women, they will just take everything that you have. And so we have to be very wise. And he looks nice. He looks all right. But then he's uh, using worldly wisdom with the wife. And he say, you know, he would uh, dribble her this way, dribble her that way. And if that uh, woman wants, uh, wants to find out, looks like uh, there's something fishy here. There's something wrong here. My husband, I think that thing you told me the other time, looks like, um, I want to believe you, but it looks like this is uh, not believable. Ah, uh -uh, you don't believe me. And then they'll bring another lie to cover the smaller lie. And they're operating in worldly wisdom. Their family is not based on the truth of the word of God, but on worldly wisdom. There will be no peace in your heart. There will be no peace uh, in your family. And there will be no peace when you cross over to the other side. All that worldly wisdom, you will bury here today in Jesus' name. The first, first Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 20. First Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? You see that? If you operate in worldly wisdom, you say you are in the church, you say you are born again, you say you are a child of God. All you have is worldly wisdom. You don't have the wisdom of the word of God. Anything you, you, you cannot say, I'm sorry about that. Because worldly wisdom will not allow you to apologize. I know that that is wrong. I shouldn't go that direction. Worldly wisdom will not allow you to live a righteous life. You are living in hypocrisy and, du and diplomacy and whatever it is. The duplicity shows that you have worldly wisdom. And that worldly wisdom will disappoint you on the final day. I pray you repent before it becomes too late. Look at, look at verse 21. For after that... In the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. The world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God that by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I pray you'll be saved. I said, I pray you'll be saved. We're looking at number three. Not no peace for wanting worshippers. No peace for wanting worshippers. Remember that word wanting. When Daniel interpreted uh, the writing on the wall uh, for that uh, Belshazzar, and he says, you are weighed and found wanting. There are people like that. They cry peace, peace, but they are wanting. They are lacking. They are lacking in righteousness. They are lacking in truthfulness. They are lacking in transparency. Their lives are not transparent. And the kind of uh, you know, life they live is like, they just they live their lives in deception, in deception, and they deceive even the people they respect. They say they respect. 
they deceive even the people they say they love. They, they deceive anybody and everybody because, you know, it's the way of uh, whatever it is, whatever will work because in this life, I want to make it. I want to do this. I want to do this. And whatever will give them that expediency, that's what they're going to do. They do not look at, but is this not a lie? Is this not of the world? Is this not deception? Is this not eroding into their Christian life? They don't think about that. All they're thinking about is the word expediency. And they say, I'm going to get my way through. But you know, if Jesus comes and meets you in that condition, huh, you will cry, nobody will be able to wipe away the tear. I pray that things will change. Church, I said, I pray things will change. Uh, look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 11. It says, therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Look at verse 15. It says in verse 15, it looks like I'm reading an extra verse to you there. I, you are not paying for that. That one is a bonus. I'm coming to chapter 8 now. Are you ready? Aren't you happy you are getting bonus? Say I'm happy. Look at Jeremiah chapter 8 now. Jeremiah chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 11. In verse 11, for they, for they have healed the heart of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when, tell me out aloud, when there is no peace, look at verse 15 there, it says, we looked for peace, but no good came, and for a time of health, and behold, trouble. Look at verse 20, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we're not saved. They could have been saved. They were going to a sanctuary, they could have been saved. They were going to a temple, they could have been saved. There were prophets to talk to them and lead them like Jeremiah. They could have been saved. And they could have straightened out their lives and repented and called upon the Lord. But they were not saved because some people were deceiving them. And they were saying, peace, peace, when there was no peace. We're looking at Lamentation chapter 1. Lamentation chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 3. Lamentation. Chapter 1, I'm reading here from verse 3. In Lamentation chapter 1, verse 3, Judah is gone into captivity because of affliction, because of great servitude. It says, She dwelleth among the heathen, she findeth no rest. She findeth no rest. And this is Judah. All the persecutors overtook her between the straits. And let's look at, uh, let's look at uh, verse uh, 5. In verse 5 it says, Our adversaries are the chief. Our enemies prosper. For the Lord has afflicted her. For the multitude of her transgressions. Her children are gone into captivity before the enemy. Look at verse 6. And from the daughter of Zion, all her beauty is departed. Her princes have become like hearts that find no pasture and they are gone without they are gone without strength before the pursuer look at verse 8 in verse 8 jerusalem has grievously sinned therefore she is removed jerusalem has grievously sinned therefore she is removed and then it goes on to say all her honored all that honored her despise her because they have seen her nakedness yea she sighs and turneth backward her filthiness is in her skirts and she remembereth not her last age you see the people who act and they don't remember their last age their last day and they don't remember what goes, what is going on or going to happen beyond the grave. Therefore, she came down woefully, wonderfully. She had no comforter. O oh Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has magnified himself. We're coming to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 
First Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. First Thessalonians chapter 5, reading from verse 1. No peace for wanting worshippers. They're worshipping, but they do not follow the way of righteousness. There's no peace for them. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. But other times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then tell me, sudden destruction cometh upon them and prevail as upon a woman or child, and they shall not escape. When they shall say peace and safety, then something will happen. The rapture takes place. The people of God are gone. There's uh, the great tribulation here on earth. And eventually, as they're looking for the time of peace, no, you don't find that at the time of the great tribulation. And then the Antichrist will come and will say, if you're going to eat, you must take the mark of the Antichrist. If you're going to trade, you must have the mark of the beast. I pray you'll not be here at that time. At that time, there'll be no rest for anybody. There'll be no peace for anybody. That's why the wisest thing to do is to say that now that Jesus Christ is giving us peace, I'm going to accept him. I'm going to receive him. I'm going to turn away from my sin, and I'm going to have the salvation of the Lord. And when you have the salvation of the Lord, the peace that you have, the peace with God will come in your soul. And the peace of God will reign in your heart. And the God of peace, as you move on, will sanctify you in Jesus' name. But for the careless ones, careless worshippers, they come to church, but they aren't going to repent. They come to church, they're not going to be born again. They come to church, and they're not going to give themselves fully, completely unto the Lord. And all they have is, uh, you know, the wickedness or the worldly wisdom, or just the shallow, empty, superficial worship. See what will happen to them on the final day. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 10. Revelation chapter 14, verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. In, and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up. How long? The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Look up here for a moment. The peace of God is available now. And the pardon of God is available now. Reconciliation with God is available now. Salvation is available now. And it doesn't take much. You can be saved tonight. If you're back to you, you can be restored tonight. It's just a matter of turning away from your sin, repenting, and saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I give up. I give up that sin. I give up that evil. I give up that way of backsliding. I give up all the terrible things and all the atrocious things and all the dirty things and all the defiling things that I've done. The drinking, I give up. The fornication, I give up. And the fighting, I give up. And the ways of the world, Lord, I give up. Lord, I repent. Lord, I turn. And as you turn, as you turn, and you look at Jesus Christ who died for you on the cross of Calvary, say, I believe, Lord. I believe, Lord, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I want to have that everlasting life now. As you believe on the Lord, it's settled, it's settled. I'm being justified. By faith, we have peace with God. And then you keep on submitting to the word of God. You keep on surrendering your life to the Lord fully and completely. And day by day, you're living according to the word of the Lord. And the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise. And when the saints are caught up, thank God, you'll be there. I will be there. I will be there. But if you delay, if you delay, if while you are hearing the word of God, then you delay, you do not give yourself to the Lord, see what will happen on the final day. There's no peace here on earth. There's no peace here on the other side. And it says, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up. 
forever and ever. Hundred years, they're still suffering. A thousand years, they're still suffering. Ten thousand years, they're still suffering. A million years, think about that. They're still suffering because it says it has sent it off forever and ever. And they have, and they have, tell me, and they have, tell me out aloud, tell me again. And they have no rest, they have no peace, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. I pray that will not be your Lord. We come to point number three now, the power over the prince of this world. The power over the prince of this world. We're coming to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, and I'm reading here from verse 30 and 31. John chapter 14, we're looking at verse 30 as well as verse 31. It says here after, I will talk, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. That's what Jesus said. I pray you'll be able to say the same thing. I said you'll be able to say the same thing. But you know, if, you, uh, if you've been in the occult, in the occultic uh, society, and you have covenant with them, and you have the regalia. You have not bunch the regalia. You have all the charms. You have not bunch all the charms. And you have all the things you are using. You have not bunch them. You cannot say the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. If you have, uh, you know, been taking bribes, and uh, through that bribe, you built this and built that and got that, and uh, Satan knows that, it is through his uh, kind of uh, influence that you got all those things. You cannot say the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in, uh, in me. If you have, uh, you know, you say you're a man, and then you go out to the village and you bring a daughter of uh, Satan, and uh, you bring her uh, home, uh, I don't want to wait for, you know, they say, be not on equal yoke together with unbelievers. I cannot wait. And then you bring uh, that unbeliever, and she's there, and you have not even you have not bothered to pay dowry. You just want to. I want a woman to stay with me. You cannot say that the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in, in me. If you have anything of sin that is still abiding in you, you cannot say like Jesus Christ that the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in, in me. Look at this. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh. And that's nothing in me. That's what Christ said. That's what you will say. I said that's what you will say. You will have victory. You will have dominion. You will have authority. And you will live a life that is free from any interruption and any infiltration of Satan in Jesus' name. Wouldn't it be wonderful, wonderful when you stand to pray and when you stand before the throne of God and you're looking up to heaven, you're praying and then you know from the depths of your heart the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. And then you can ask any of the people of the world that belong to the devil, if you have anything in me, you can tell. If you have any secret in your hand about me, you can tell. And they cannot say that. And then you are so confident in prayer. You are so confident before the throne. Because, you know, the blood of Jesus Christ has washed you. Washed you through and through. And you are whiter than snow. And like Jesus Christ, you could say, the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. That will be a glorious day. I said that will be a glorious day. It will happen to you today. As you kind of empty your heart and empty your pocket and anything of the devil, say, I throw back, I throw it back to the devil. I said, I throw it back to the devil. Anything the devil has deposited in your life, you say, I throw it off, and then the blood of Jesus cleanses you and washes you whiter than snow. And there you can say, the priest of this world has nothing in me. I'm looking at somebody there, it will happen. I said it will happen. You'll have boldness before the throne. You'll have courage before the throne. Anywhere you go, you'll be a man of authority. You'll be a woman of authority. Look at verse 31. But the world, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise and let us go hence. When you arise tonight, we'll go out in victory. You'll go out in power. You'll go out in authority. 
The power is power over the prince of the world. You know why he has the power over the prince of the world? Number one, the absolute sinlessness of Christ. The absolute sinlessness of Christ. Because there was no sin in him. Because sin belongs to Satan. Sin belongs to the devil. And because he says the prince of this world cometh, he has nothing in me. Number one, the absolute sinlessness of Christ. Number two, the absolute supremacy of Christ. The absolute supremacy of Christ. He has power, all power, all authority over that Satan, over the prince of this world. Number three is absolute submission unto God. It's absolute submission unto God. Number one, the absolute sinlessness of Christ. It tells us in that John, that John chapter 14, ever starting, hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. That's my Jesus. That's my Savior. That's my Lord. He could speak with boldness and with courage and with confidence. The priest of this world comes and a sinner did not have any place to stay in the life, in the heart, in the thought of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 15. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For ye, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched for the feeling of our infirmities. But look at this, look at this. He was in all points tempted like we are, like as we are, and yet without sin. And yet without sin is absolute sinlessness. Look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That's Jesus Christ, no sin, absolute sinlessness of Christ. That's why I could say, the prince of this world cometh, and has nothing in me. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and verse 19. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18, for as much as she know that she were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's Jesus. Any sin in Jesus? I said any sin in Jesus? No, never. First, first John chapter 3, verse 5. First John chapter 3, verse 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Say that with me. And in him is no sin. I can't hear you. Look at verse 6, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let not let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin. What? Oh, no, that person cannot stand up and say like Jesus, the priest of this world cometh and he has nothing in me. Satan will say, huh? Shut up, you are telling another lie. How about the lie? How about the deception? How about the stealing? How about the fraud? How about the bribery? How about the corruption? How about the anger? How about the wrath? How about the cheating? How about the hypocrisy? Don't say that Satan has nothing in you. But you know, if you're born again, and day by day you are living the victorious life, it's going to start tonight. Victorious life. I said victorious life. That the devil comes from this direction, you say, no way. He comes from that direction, you say, no way. And the way he used to come before, I will put your back on the wall, and I begin to cry again, oh God, have mercy on me, I've fallen again, you will not fall again. 
then you'll be able to say, the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in, in me. Look at that verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9, whosoever, that's me. I said whosoever, that's me. In the night, that's you. In the day, this is you. In your place of work, this is you. Anywhere we find you, this is you. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Give me a good amen. amen. First John chapter 5, first John chapter 5, verse 18. First John chapter 5, verse 18. We know. That whosoever is born of God sinneth not. You have not opened your Bible. Are you there? First John chapter verse chapter 5, verse 18. For we know, do you know? For we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. Tell me the rest. And that wicked one touches him not. Number one, Christ's absolute sinlessness. The absolute sinlessness of Christ. Number two, his absolute supremacy over Satan. We're coming back to John chapter 14, verse 30. John chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 30. It says in verse 30, hereafter, I will not talk much with you. For the prince of this world cometh. Tell me what you'll find there. Tell me out aloud. And has nothing in me. The prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. He's talking about Satan. That's why he calls the prince of this world. Because he has absolute supremacy over the devil. Chapter 12, John chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 31. John chapter 12, verse 31. It says, Now is the judgment of this world, and now shall the prince of this world be, tell me, cast out. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. You'll not have a place in your heart, no place in your brain. No place in your family. The prince of this world, Christ had absolute supremacy over him. And because Christ dwells in you, you'll have absolute supremacy over him too. In Jesus' name. John chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 11. John chapter 16, verse 11 of judgment. Because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world is judged. Thank God you have victory. In Christ, you have victory. Because of salvation, you have victory. Look at 1 John chapter 4. We're looking at verse 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. It says here of God, little children, and I've overcome them because greater is seed that is in you. Than he that is in the world. He lives in me. He abides in me. He's mighty in me. He's stronger in me. He says, Greater is seed that is in you than he that is in the world. Something is going to happen. Look at this. Look at this. We're looking at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. I've been uh, reminding you that. We're waiting for the rapture any moment from now. The rapture will happen. And then uh, after the rapture, what will follow? The great tribulation. Seven years of the great tribulation. Christ will come. He'll come from on high. He'll come from heaven. And he comes with the saints. And then he establishes his kingdom. And when he establishes his kingdom, it will be a time of millennial reign. At the beginning of that millennial reign, look at the authority of Christ. I'm looking at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 2. Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. And he laid hold of the dragon, 
that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and he bound him a thousand years, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Only Christ can do that. I said only Christ can do that. And he shut him up and set his seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. After that 1,000 years, millennial reign, he'll be released out of that bottomless pit. And then he'll try to deceive some people in the world. And then look at his final end. Jesus as supreme authority, final authority, and absolute supremacy over the devil. And if Christ lives in you, there is nothing to fear. I said, if Christ lives in you, there is nothing to fear. Look at verse 10, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. How did Jesus have all this absolute sinlessness and absolute supremacy? That brings us to the final point, absolute submission to God. Absolute submission to God. When you surrender yourself to you totally unto the Lord, like Jesus did unto the Heavenly Father, you yourself to you, you have authority. You will have power. You will have supremacy. And the power of the Lord will be working in your life in Jesus' name. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 31. But that the world may know that I love the Father, as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. As the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. That was the major sin. That was the central sin. That was the essential sin in the heart, in the life of Jesus Christ. He looked at the Father. He had the Father. He took the word of the Father. He obeyed the Father in everything. Look at John chapter 4, verse 34. John chapter 4, verse 34. It says, Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. He said, that's what I'm looking at every time. That's my focus every time. That's my attention every time. That's my concentration, consecration every time. To do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Chapter 5, verse 30. Chapter 5, verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing as I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will. That's Christ. I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. Chapter 8, chapter 6, verse 38. Chapter 6, verse 38. It says, For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. See that? Always submissive to the Father. Always submissive to our God. And look at chapter 8 and verse 28. Chapter 8, verse 28. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me. Chapter 8, chapter 8, chapter 8. We're looking at verse 28. In chapter 8, verse 28, here it says, Then Jesus said unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am him, and that I do nothing of myself. Look at that. Look at that. If you could say that, I do nothing you know, of myself. If you could follow Christ, if you could abide in Christ, if the word of God could abide in you, if the life of Christ could be transferred to you, if Jesus could be your master and your model, if Jesus would be the strength in your heart, if Jesus will be your focus, if Jesus will be your concentration, if you will so consecrate yourself and you so abandon yourself to the Lord, and your life will be like the life of Jesus Christ, and you can say like him, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. Verse 29, and he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. For I do, how often? For I do tell me out aloud. I pray you'll be able to say that. 
when the grace of God becomes abundant in your life, when the truth of God becomes to, to, totally embedded in you, when you are swallowed up in the will of the Almighty God, and your thoughts, your mind, your will, everything about you is about Him. And then you can say, like Jesus Christ, for I do always those things that please Him. Look at chapter 12, John chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 49. John chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 49. It says, For I have not spoken of myself. See that. A believer, if you're a believer and you're totally in Christ, and you're totally submitted and submissive to the Lord, for I have not spoken of myself, for the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. He gave me a commandment, and I always abide by that. And if you're a believer, if you're a child of God, he gave you a commandment, and you want to abide by that all the time. It says, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. You will be like that. I said you will be like that. I'm coming now to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. The Lord wants to transfer his victory into your life. It's righteousness in your life. It's testimony in your life. It says in verse 27, peace, I live with you. Perfect peace, personal peace, family peace, peace in your place of work, peace all around, peace in the day, and peace in the night is given to you now. I receive. I receive. Peace I live with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world give, giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. No anxiety anymore. No worry anymore. No restlessness anymore. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you. After the Bible study, you're not going to be hanging around talking and talking, talking there, talking there, and letting the blessings of God leak away from you. Don't talk much. Take this blessing, go back home, and go in victory. For the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. His sickness will not be in you. His oppression will not be in you. His defeat will not be in you. The prince of this world cometh. Somebody say that. The prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. Stand up and confess that. Stand up and confess that. The prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. The prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. He wants you to have the victory. He wants you to have the authority. He wants you to have the commitment. He wants you to have the courage. He wants you to have the confidence that he can so live in you. He can so abide in you. He can so occupy your heart and fill your heart that you can say anytime, anywhere, the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. There is peace in your heart. There is righteousness in your life. And then there is authority. And then there is a word of command. And you can say by the grace of God on the inside of me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. Give your life to the Lord. Surrender your life to the Lord. And be free tonight. And be free tonight. And be free tonight. And have the power and have the authority that you can tell. And heaven can hear that even though the prince of this world may come, he has nothing, nothing, nothing in you.